Hey everyone, welcome to Sum Zero. Today we're going to have a slightly different conversation. Normally we talk about uh, stocks exclusively, but today we're going to talk about AI and machine learning, how it's impacting investing. We're here with David Trainer. He's the CEO of New Constructs, which uses quantitative methodologies to, you know, basically build portfolios. David's also been on Sum Zero for a very long time and is a long-term contributor to the platform. And so we're uh, really happy to have him you know, share his wisdom and, and tell us kind of more about his learnings and thoughts on AI. Dave, thanks for coming and chatting with us. Uh, so obviously there's been an enormous stream of headlines in the news about AI. I, you know, maybe just to start with, just give us your high level kind of thoughts on how much of it's sort of hype, how much of it's real and, and, and sort of how you were you know, you're leveraging it for your own investing purposes, because I think a lot of a lot of folks are, are thinking along the same lines. Yeah, uh, sure. Thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, we, we've enjoyed being on some zero for, for many, many years. I think we've been ranked number one in several categories, including all time for something like 36 months straight. And a big part of that for us is AI. We started doing AI before the term AI really even existed. And I think what, what you know, the, I think the big takeaway for me to share today, Divya, is that, you know, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors around AI. Most of it is not real. Most of it doesn't work. I mean, would you say that chat GPT works or does any technology work if you can't trust it all the time? I mean, that's kind of the problem with this full self-driving or automated driving if it works 99% of the time, that's not good enough because that 1% of the time kills someone, that's a problem. You know, and so much I think of AI is really just people sort of like blockchain trying to tap into a market mania or theme that they think is going to boost the valuation of their company or boost, boost a stock. And so I was hoping to spend a little time today just to kind of help people understand how to discern between AI that's real and AI that isn't real, AI that works and AI that doesn't really work so that people can be a little smarter about how to invest into what is, you know, the biggest thing to hit the markets in, I don't know, maybe since the internet bubble. Yeah. I mean, your, your firm has been doing, you know, quantitatively or, or fundamental quantum mental investing for, for quite some time, I guess, at what point would you say you were using some you know tools that would be categorized or considered AI as opposed to maybe traditional quantitative methods. Like, what is the sort of distinguishment you know distinguishing line between you know what what you used to do, you know, which was always quantitatively informed, versus maybe what you're doing now? Yeah, you know, look, I think all these definitions are really kind of fuzzy and 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 blurry. I would never say we were quants, right? We're not quants. I sort of feel like. There've been three stages of, of what I maybe you call value investing. One is sort of the Ben Graham, Warren Buffett picking up cigar butts. Number two, value investing 2.0 was quantum mental. It's the whole quant thing where people are basically looking at data at scale and making large making decisions more algorithmically based on rules on large scale data sets. And I would call what we do value investing 3.0, and that is really doing what Warren Buffett and Ben Graham would do at scale. And that really is, I think, our own very proprietary and unique way of going about the investing process. And I think the results speak for themselves and, and, and how we've done on your platform and various other studies and papers that, that prove what we have is unique. But the idea really more than anything is that when I was on Wall Street, people used to read 10Ks and 10Qs and go through the footnotes. And then the internet, and then the internet bubble hit. And that got swept under the rug pretty quickly in favor of doing deals. You know, I was a Credit Suisse. I had a front row seat for her, how that firm had a really good focus on high quality research and really digging into the numbers. And then, you know, Quattrone joined and it came about getting IPOs done and pretty much nothing else. And we know where that ended, right? The uh, Spitzer settlement and Credit Suisse having to pay the biggest fine of all 10 banks because they were, you know, sending emails to their clients and friends saying, I can't believe anybody is dumb enough to invest in this piece of blank right after publishing a glowing IPO report, right? That's on the record. And so it occurred to me that if we didn't develop technology to actually go through these filings and really build the models the way people were supposed to build them, it might not ever get done. And so 20 years ago is when we started doing that. And I, you know, the word, the term machine learning wasn't around. 
And but I would call it machine learning because it's really ultimately what what I set up our technology to do. Because look, at the end of the day, humans don't really want to read. Not that many humans want to read 10Ks and 10Qs. I don't know if there are any humans that want to do it all day long for weeks on end, which is what's required if you want to maintain a database of really correct and and fresh data. There's no other way to do it. So uh, 20 years ago, you started developing what sounds like some kind of parsing engine that would physically read filings. And what, now, so how is like, do you, do you, do you sort of tell your algorithms to look for certain strings or certain types of data or what, what would you be looking for typically? And then how do you, I guess, deposit that info into your own model that's then going to spit you some intrinsic valuation a la Warren Buffett or some of the professors we might have had in business school. Yeah, I think, you know, it starts with the fact that this the, the uh, most AI people imagine that, that there's some expert programmer who goes in, comes up with some algo or application or software program that goes and figures data out. And that's not how it works. It's not how it can work because machines aren't going to figure anything out that humans haven't figured out. Right. And so the only real way, especially when you're dealing with financial filings and the extreme disparity and irregularity of the disclosures in those filings, you really have to take a comprehensive approach to teaching the machine. And it's long and ugly and boring. I know because I did it right. And I did it manually for a really long time. So the original automation, Divya, was was really an application that combined the, the actual source filing a parsing tool and the database all in one. And the, the, it was critical for these things to be all connected because we wanted to be able to audit whatever an analyst parsed back to the original source. You can't do that on any other platform, by the way, right? If you want to go to S&P Capital IQ, say, hey, where do you get these adjustments for extraordinary items? We can't show you that. I know because professors at Harvard Business School and MIT Sloan spent a long time embedded in S&P Capital IQ, comparing our data to theirs as part of a paper that proves that our data is superior. It's been published in the Journal of Financial Economics, a top number three peer review journal in the world, right? So it's this is, yeah. this is a fact. I'm not just making this stuff up. And so we, we put all that together in a way that allowed us to, to audit and actually understand where the data comes from at the source, because people make mistakes. And sometimes, you know, we've we may have collected data in a certain way and we need to move it to someplace else because the treatment, the accounting treatment is not what we thought it to be. So that was the original technology. Now, part of making sure that technology would actually work at scale meant we had to have a taxonomy for all data going into the project because you don't know where the data is going to go. You got a human in there parsing and that human doesn't know where the data is going to go. That's a problem. They put it in the wrong spot, you know, and, and the model doesn't work, right? And so my experience at Credit Suisse was across all companies and all sectors around the world. So I, I had a really robust taxonomy going into it. Now, the important thing about this taxonomy, really important thing about it, is that it really, it's not based on accounting. It's based on economics, understanding the economics of a business. Because accounting doesn't do that. Accounting is really just counting things up. I call it like the, the vocabulary. Right. And finance is the language with the message being the economics. I want to understand the economics of the business. And people don't always realize that there's a big disconnect between economics and, and accounting when it comes to understanding a business. And so, yes, yeah, so let's let's get into that, because this is something I think you've written about kind of like economic value. We, we sort of, I guess, traditionally think of things like net present value as being, you know, maybe the intrinsic value that we're sort of shooting to calculate when we're analyzing free cash flows and the like. It sounds like you've got a maybe a, a tweak on that framework. Maybe you can just quickly talk about that because I know that's sort of, it sounds like that's what you're, you're sort of parsing for as you're going through these statements. So can you just, just so folks kind of understand your general philosophy around economic value, like what that is in your eyes? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of terms for that. Economic value add, C added CFROI, RONA, ROIC. We don't really care about what methodology. I'm not here to sell religion. I'm here to get a better data set, collect a more comprehensive data set. And early in my career, I learned that there was a difference between accounting results and economic results. 
And it was actually part of an executive compensation consulting business where we went to boards of directors and said, whatever you do, don't pay executives based on accounting earnings because you can grow accounting earnings while running the business into the ground. And that's where I learned to really take a more comprehensive perspective on the financials. Because looking at accounting earnings is like going to the doctor, tell him you're sick. And he says, okay, yeah, you know, let me check your ears and say, tell you whether or not you're sick. You, you need a full body physical, which means you need the, the full, you need to analyze the full financial filing, MDNA footnotes, mm -hmm. everything. And it's really, it's a difficult process because there's like 250 to 2000 pages in these filings, but you never know when right. you're going to get something you needed to look at. So you got to check them all. And so that's what our technology effectively did. And the original technology Divya was more designed around helping a human do that work more quickly than it was to get a machine to do it for a human. Because we couldn't get a machine to do it until the human had really programmatically, systematically, and repeatedly explained exactly what the machine needed to do because the machine's not going to figure it out on its own. And there are plenty of studies that, that validate this. There's a a study published in, in on CNBC recently about Patronus AI, which is a firm that does nothing but help evaluate LLMs and AIs that, that analyze financial filings. And the results so far are a joke. Nobody's coming close to getting an AI to analyze a financial filing. And that's why I said people are trying to get the machine and technology to do it first. They're putting the cart before the horse. My technology was effectively... Giving my, my giving my analyst a tool to go through the filing more quickly so that as they went through the tool in that application we created, the machine was tracking it. And over time, as analysts went through lots of filings, we created enough high quality machine learning instructions for the machine to begin to take over. And as that happened, we could cover more companies and go through filings more quickly. When you use the term machine, what what is the actual tech stack that you're relying on? You know, is it something you've built internally, or is it um, something you modified using an outsourced, like a pre-existing tool, or what? Like, what is the actual piece of technology that you're it's 100, using? It's 100 proprietary, Divi. There's nobody's done anything like what we've done, right? And and part of what the the, the paper that the Harvard Business School and MIT Sloan people wrote proves is that the market is missing footnotes. The market's missing uh -huh. footnotes. That's part of why our stock picks do so well. We have an information advantage, right? And the market's missing footnotes. The technology is entirely proprietary. No one's done anything like it before. You think about the legacy data collection business. The model is to have a thousand people in an offshore location collecting data manually for the most part, right? There's not, there's not technology <laughs> built. There's no tech, and, and the taxonomies are are inadequate, which is why they can't tell you where they get the adjustments for extraordinary items. Because the analysts maybe are treating things differently, the collection analysts treating these differently, or they don't know what bucket to put it in because they're not as sophisticated as the experts that we have using our technology. Yeah. And then the other big thing- When you say taxonomy, are you referring to a specific set of, of phrases that the machine is looking for? to, to no. extract from filings or what, what is that? What do you, how are you using yeah. the term? Think about taxonomy is more almost like an ontology. It's about how all the data should be organized. So when we're going through an income statement, what items get put in, what, what line items for that income statement get put in revenue, what get put in cost of goods sold, what put, get put in operating expenses, what could puts, what gets put in non-operating, what could puts in, what gets put in taxes on the balance sheet, what gets put in, in current assets, long-term liabilities, short-term liabilities. And the footnotes, where does that data go? Where, where do you put a liability related to options? You know, how does that get incorporated? And so that feeds back into our economic earnings model, which is effectively building a more robust income statement and balance sheet. What we call NOPAT is a more robust income statement. What we call invested capital is a more robust balance sheet. And our taxonomy is a is effectively a bucket system or buckets where all the data from the filing goes into how to calculate those two items more intelligently and completely. Yeah, so, that's fascinating. So, you know, footnote items will affect certain things in NOPAT. Footnote items will set will affect certain things in invested capital. 
And so that's really what I'm saying. We had to translate accounting into economic. And we call NOPAT and invested capital our economic statements because they take into account the full financial picture. And the taxonomy is effectively all the different buckets that all the data points from every single filing could go into that inform a more robust calculation of either no pad yeah. or invested capital. So when your machine says, uh, well, actually, maybe a simple question: What is the output of the machine? Is it is it just is it a stock price, like kind of an intrinsic value calculation, or what? What is the actual result of the analysis you're doing? Great question. So you know, our our output is 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 you know data feeds, right? We actually we power fundamental data for IEX Cloud as an example. So we have a fundamental data feed, right? And, and we compete with FactSet, Bloomberg, CapIQ for providing that data. We have proprietary data feeds that go to quant funds. Um, around our more our proven superior measure of core earnings. That paper I referred to earlier, the title of the paper is Core Earnings, New Data and Evidence. And it effectively proves that we have a better measure of earnings that's more predictive of future stock prices, as well as earnings beats and misses. And then we have ratings, uh, a website. It's a fairly, I call it a, a, a fully vertically integrated research platform. We collect the data, we do the analytics, we build the models. And we have all the output that any other research firm would have, including PDF reports that we've supplied to firms like TD Ameritrade, Interactive Brokers on 3,000 stocks, 7,000 mutual funds, 1,000 ETFs. We do credit ratings. So we, we do pretty much everything you'd want to do with this effectively just a better database, a better data set, a better data foundation. Got it. And then do you use any of that to actually make investments in stocks yourself? Like, is that also part of, you know, the broader business? We do not have a hedge fund right now. We were a hedge fund for about 10 years, 2006 to 2016. That's when we think got on your platform. We were managing money at the time. Now we've, we, we really, we shut that business down and we've now focused on really an ETF business where we are launching an ETF around our proprietary core earnings with Bloomberg and First Trust. It's called the Bloom, the First Trust New Constructs Core Earnings Leaders ETF, and and so that's where that that's where we're sort of in asset management. But we also use it for re writing the research and doing the research, yeah. and building the model. Um, that's really, with the ETF, is the idea that you'd pick like the top quartile or something and put all of that in a portfolio, or what's the sort of general yeah. plan? We we put the companies with the the least amount of earnings distortion, the highest the, and the best sort of earnings quality according to our measure of core earnings in every yeah. sector. So it's it's a it's a blend. It's not growth or core across all sectors of the effectively core earnings leaders. And is it it's just all equal weighted? If a name kind of meets the test, it's it's equal weighted in the ETF, or how, how does that well, work? I think there's a little bit of market weight going on. I don't have the methodology in front of me exactly. There's a prospectus that's been filed that has that, and I should know that, Divya, but I, I don't yeah. I don't have all those details in front of me right now. But it's not it's not entirely equal weighted. There are position caps, so it's a sort of blend between market weight and equal weight. Got it. Really cool. So let's go through a couple examples that you've you've written about. I mean, let's start with Photolab because I, I know you've you've written about that one. Maybe you can just talk through how the machine interpreted core earnings for that name and and just where the valuation came from. If you can kind of talk about that. Yeah. So one of the things we're always looking for uh, as a as a starting point in in our system and and the benefit of of of, of the system really is that with this great database. We're able to screen with precision. Typically, screening in value investing 2.0, right, was, all right, I don't really have great data from any of these databases, but I don't want to have to do a deep dive on every single company. So I'm going to sort of screen down to a smaller group of companies before I do my deep dive digging because I can't do it on that many companies. Well, we've done that deep dive digging on all of them so we can screen for the best stocks pretty quickly. And so I misspoke before. It's not Photo Labs, it's Phototronics. The ticker is P Lab. And that's yeah, how we it. found, you know, that's how we found that stock. It, it, it was a, a stock that we, you know, we were looking specifically for AI stocks that hadn't had a huge run up, right? AI before they got, you know, b before everyone knew that they were AI effectively. And I think we we I can't believe how long ago we wait, hold on. I can't remember. We we put this up around October, November last year. The stock has meaningfully outperformed 
uh, and what we're looking for is super high quality of earnings and a cheap valuation. So you, you asked me about output before, Divya. And so I, I look at fundamental research in two buckets. I want to understand the, the cash flows and the fundamentals today. And then I want to understand the future cash flows implied by the stock price. So I don't produce any intrinsic value, right? I, I prefer to be a critic of a fortune teller than to be a fortune teller. Mr. Market mm -hmm. is our fortune teller every day. He's given us a stock price. So we call it, you know, reverse engineering the current stock price, also known as expectations investing. Books have been written about this, right? The idea is that rather than trying to predict the future, I understand the prediction embedded in the current stock price. And when we sure. looked at, at, at Phototronics or Photronics, we saw stock price that implied negative profit growth, a permanent 20% decline in profits was what was baked in the stock price. And we thought, oh my gosh, these guys have a technology that's essential to the development of, of semiconductors, which is essential to development of AI. And it's trading as if its profits are going to permanently decline by 20%. And its profits are excellent and growing historically. So there's a disconnect. And then we do deeper digging into why we think, you know, those expectations are too low and how it compares to competitors and all that. But that's, that, that's sort of that, our methodology. Uh, that, deeper digging, that deeper digging aspect of your process, is that primarily a human-led process or is that also assisted by um, machines or, or AI in some capacity? That's that's more, that's a bit of a human, more human layer. Right. So the, yeah. the machine will, will do all that fundamental basics for us where we understand profitability and valuation, the expectations baked into the stock price, et cetera. And then we do sort of more traditional Porter's five forces kind of thing. Like, how are they positioning the industry? What do their competitors look like? What do we see as the macro forces affecting growth and profitability long term? And for this one, it was really easy, right? It's the semiconductor, AI, like we got huge tailwinds. You know, this is a huge tide lifting most ships. How is this business compared to others in the business? Will it will its ship rise as fast as the others? You know, why is it cheap? Is it cheap for a reason? You got to do that kind of work. And but it's all done on, on what is a, I think, superior fundamental foundation. Have you run your analysis on the big tech names that are kind of at the center of all this, like the Microsoft's, Meta's, Google's, like anyone who's building their own large language model? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like NVIDIA, and we've done some some write-ups on NVIDIA, and we've done some what we call reverse DCF case studies. And and look, the last time we we you know we we published one of those, NVIDIA was half of what it was now. And the the stock price implied that its profits going to be larger than the GDP of Mexico. So that you know, that's a great expect that's a great analysis or example of expectations investing or re reverse DCF analysis where you can just see yeah. really quickly just how ridiculous the valuation is. Got uh, it. What, and what did you, what did you find for the other names? Cause they, they obviously don't have as high a valuation. I'm just curious. Yeah. My, Microsoft, you know, these Microsoft, NVIDIA, NVIDIA Microsoft's not as expensive as NVIDIA, but it's still really expensive. Uh, and we're seeing returns on invested capital fall. Whereas NVIDIA, we're yeah. still seeing returns on invested capital extraordinarily high levels, right? For example, return on invested capital for NVIDIA is like 130%. And, you know, it was at, you know, 50% into 2023, 2024, huge jump. So in fiscal 24 so far. And mm -hmm. so that's good. Whereas whereas with with Microsoft, return on invested capital is kind of fallen from around 50% to 25%. So it's, you know, it's fallen in half. Now it's still really strong, but, you know, I don't feel, and the valuation is, isn't as high, but there's still a disconnect where the valuation is too high. Yeah. Is there a sector in particular right now where you're seeing, you know, more potential? I mean, obviously tech has run up a lot in the last 12 months. What, like what, what are the sectors where you're seeing, you know, more dislocations where people are ignoring them for whatever reason? Maybe they're not at all related to AI, but but have plenty of growth ahead of their, you know, ahead. Yeah, I'm looking at our, at our sector research right now, and we rank all the sectors because you know all this when, when we do all this work on the all the individual companies, we're able to aggregate these super high quality models into super high quality analysis of sectors, 
In fact, we publish reports on how free cash flow is is going for every sector. We do it for the S&P. We do it for the overall market. Um, same is true for how, how, how do the core earnings of the sector compare to accounting earnings? How do the economic earnings or EBA of the sector compare to accounting earnings? And so we do that work. Energy, you know, the one, uh, let me first say a, a, a qualifier. I don't really believe in pure base sector investing. I think that's oftentimes a lazy approach. I think it's, oh, well, I don't have the ability to do the work on all the individual companies, so I'm going to just try to find the right sector. And, mm -hmm. and that can kind of work sometimes, but, you know, Divya, we know that not all, not all companies within a sector are good. In fact, you know, technology is one where, you know, we give that a neutral rating. It's middle of the pack. But, you know, that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of great companies. There's just a lot of really expensive stocks in there. The number one ranked sector in our system right now is energy. I think there's still a lot overlooked there. There's a lot of really yeah. cheap stocks, a lot of great cash flows. And people, uh, because of some of this ESG overplay, I think, uh, are ignoring the fact that there is a significant, significant growth in energy demand. And that growth will be fed by fossil fuels for the foreseeable future because alternative energy sources are just not able to generate enough energy to take off the burden from fossil fuels. So there's just What do you say to people what do you say to people who would would sort of take their money and just put it in the S&P 500 today? Like what's your general view on not trying to, you know, pick stocks but just buying the S&P or or some other index for that matter? The first thing I would say is as like is that diversification is not a substitute for diligence. People forget that. Diversification is not a substitute for diligence. You do your work and you diversify amongst the best stocks you can, you know, you can analyze. But you don't just say, oh, you know what? I don't really know what's going on. So I'm just going to throw it into a fund. That doesn't work. Uh, and I think the S&P has often also been, unfortunately, taken over by some of the, the media and the frenzy. You know, I mean, there's some bad stocks in the S&P. I think it can sit considerably underperform uh, in the coming years because it's holding some some overly expensive and bad stocks. Uh, I think, look, if, if I had the choice between kind of dumping my money into a very well diversified fund uh, because I couldn't do the diligence, or if I had access to something that could do the diligence for me and pick good stocks based on superior fundamental research and valuation analysis, I'd go with that, you know, 100 times out of 100. That's In fact, that's how we got connected with Harvard Business School because students didn't want to take the financial statements of class anymore because they didn't think it was worth learning how to re read financial statements because who pays attention to that stuff. But if you had the ability to go through all the financial statements and get the data and the benefit of the footnotes, understand what the market is missing and build portfolios on that, you know, that's what you do all day long. But that said, you know, funds, and I'm not here to give any advice, right? This is not an advice giving situation. I'm not an advisor. Uh, that said, I think, I think, uh, you know, ETFs and, and index fund investing is probably smart for a lot of people. The other thing that's interesting with the S&P 500 today, at least, is you're obviously missing a huge chunk of the market, especially kind of the small and mid cap parts of the market. Has your model been been sort of telling you, I'm, I'm assuming it's in it's sort of market cap agnostic, um, but and if that's not the right assumption, let me know. But are, are you seeing a lot of opportunities with those lesser followed names that are Absolutely. not in that big Absolutely. Group? Look, look, I mean, Debbie, let's face it, there, there's more alpha and smaller cap. I mean, you know, the S&P is a crowded friggin' trade, right? The MAG-7 is a crowded trade. There's very difficult, it's very difficult to get alpha in, in these crowded trades. And so, but yeah. Is that supported by, or I'm just curious if that's supported by the, the data that you're seeing, that your model is actually pointing you towards a lot of stuff that's not MAG-7, not you know, big pharma, big banks, like the stuff that we we see on TV. It absolutely is, right. If you if you look at the studies that have been done on our data, uh, the core earnings data point does provide idiosyncratic novel alpha across the market, but there's more of it in smaller cap. Yeah. And, and maybe to, to sort of close, how does your, I mean, how do you and, and, and the model by extension think about like regime changes and just other types of macro events that can be sometimes hard to predict. For example, you know, I don't know, China, Taiwan, or, or maybe like an election cycle, something to that effect. 
like how, how do you plan for that? I mean, if Trump wins, does that impact your models? Maybe not, but I'm, I'm just curious how some of that macro stuff is factored in. Yeah, we, we, we call our technology robo-analyst technology, but we don't believe that we're, we're, we're here to replace humans, right? And I think that's a big thing. That's another misunderstanding around AI. Humans, humans have a lot of value to add because AI is just another machine, right? And what do machines do? Only what humans tell them. They're only as good as the quality of instructions we give them. So the, the answer to your question is that I think that, that look, ideally, you know, you have a human and machine working together. And I think those that are most successful in today's world and the coming world are ones that can use machines most effectively, can use technology most effectively. Our technology helps you do the grunt work that people have effectively kind of not been doing for a couple of decades to understand profitability and valuation. And it's humans to help look, try to, to, to look around the corner, right? Understand the macro picture and then use that to help you figure out how to pick the best stocks based on fundamentals of valuation. You know, that's, that's the idea. That's how we've done it. That's how we've been number one ranked, you know, for 36 months straight on your platform. And we've taken human expertise and layered it on top of our superior fundamental insights and voila, you've got alpha, a lot of it. I think it's a great summary. And, you know, I, I tend to agree. There's, there's, there's a lot of exciting potential combining, you know, the best of human intelligence with kind of what technology has to offer. So David, thank you again. This was great. Um, always great to chat and, you know, look forward to future conversations. Thank you. My pleasure. Good to be with you, Divya. All right. Appreciate it.